Charlie Verran was a curious little boy. He spent hours roaming through the bush and peering into rock pools. He even made his own home zoo where he kept funnel web spiders and a blue ringed octopus and various other creatures perfect for terrifying his teachers. School did not agree with Charlie, but his love of nature and his passionate desire to understand how it all worked led to a stellar career in science. He focused his mind on coral and became chief scientist of the Australian Institute of Marine Science in Townsville. Charlie Verran has discovered nearly a quarter of the world's coral species, and these discoveries come from the thousands of hours he has spent under the sea diving on coral reefs all around the world. Hi, Charlie. Welcome to Conversations. Hi, Sarah. Let's start with your experience of diving because mm-hmm. it's been such a big part of who you are as a yep. person and as a scientist. Where have you had your most memorable dives or when have you had your most memorable dives? In the dives? Northern Great Barrier Reef. It, it's partly because the area is so big and it's so remote and so much wilderness, which I love. And also it's very dramatic. Big things happen, uh, really extraordinary things happen like I've never seen anywhere else. And... It's not the biological mecca that uh, Indonesia is that. It is it's, its remoteness. Also, it's a place where so many, in my doings, dramatic things have happened. So I think of the really memorable dives in my life. They've practically all been on the Northern Great Barrier Reef. Yep. What about night diving, Charlie? Have you, <laughs> have you ever done that? Uh, yes. Um, is that a guilty laugh? Uh, it is there? a very guilty laugh because... I'm not good at following rules and regulations, and so, uh, all right, the um, memorable night dives that I have enjoyed most and got most out of, um, this is partly a personality-driven thing, what one does is put a little chemical light called a silum out on the edge of, the, uh, of, a, of an outer ribbon reef way up in the far northern Great Bay, in a very, very remote place, and have that on a buoy, and no one else knows it's there, it's easy to do. And that night we have dinner and a glass of wine maybe and whatever. And um, when else goes to bed, I jump into a zodiac and sneak away. And I uh, find my little siloom light and anchor and I go diving. This is the outer Great Barrier Reef. And if it's a moonlit night, and this is good in a moonlit night, the uh, water is very clear and honestly you could, you could, you could read a newspaper down at, um, say, um, 10 metres. It's it, so it, light. It is so light. And you uh, switch off the light and lie back and you're in a, an incredible world which is all silver and grey. And there are myriads of fish, the fish everywhere, great big schools of fish, and they'll turn one way and they'll flash silver with the moon and then they'll turn the other way and they'll flash grey. And everything is silver and grey and all the lobsters and crabs and they're all out everything's out eels are hunting some fish are asleep and then the sharks come in and um, they speed in and they wonder what the stranger is there um, bubbles and all that and they zip off into the dark and you're surrounded with dark and you have all this immediate beauty i believe it's unphotographable but for me it is an outer world experience It it is spiced with danger, of course. No one knows I'm there. If something goes wrong, I'm on my own, and I like that. I'm afraid that's me. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm a nutcase. But it is absolutely thrilling, and I'm I'm very competent at what I do. I don't believe I'm diving dangerously. What do you hear? What can you hear at night? He own bubbles, but the the racket of the reef goes... It really makes a lot of noise. What what sort of noise? Uh, Every fish... Uh, mostly crustaceans, and I don't know quite what makes the reef so noisy, but it's a very, very noisy what place. Crackles and... Crackles all the time. Crackles all the time, and different sorts of crackles and things. And it goes on all the time. Uh, and the corals, they're all extending their tentacles out, uh, which means I can't do any work because I can't identify corals, so I don't wonder what sort of coral it is. Uh, I just... They're all in silhouette too. And there's this weird grey-silver... Uh, out of this world, masses of silhouette tentacles. And so that is the most exciting dive. And I come back to the boat, maybe I'm back at 3 o'clock in the morning, 
maybe I go to bed for a couple of hours sleep and off I am and the next morning and <laughs> normally chatting. I don't tell anyone I do this, no one. I never have told a single soul. Um, what, because they'd be worried about your safety or why not? Well, no. First reason is they will want to come with me <laughs> next time. and I like doing this on my own. And I won a, a, a diving award, a lifetime achievement award for the American Association of Underwater Science. First foreigner to get this award. And they wouldn't let me go dive. This is up in Alaska they gave me this. They wouldn't let me go diving. I wanted to go diving on giant kelp beds because I didn't have all the pieces of paper. And I've never had any, I've never had a supervisor. I've never had any of this paperwork. And they wouldn't let me go. I was probably the only person in the entire conference who wasn't allowed to go diving. <laughs> so I told them the story. I, I thought, this will... It's almost out of revenge. Oh, this has shocked the hell out of because they're all, all, all the people that make regulations, and it had the absolute opposite effect. <laughs> I all thought it was a great thing to do. And one, one of these regulations soaked divers said, "I'm going to do that next time I come to your great regulation." I said, "What about the regulations?" And nice, no, that's just paperwork, man. It's paperwork for him. <laughs> so yes, but not, diving at night is very, very exciting, and you're enclosed in a world that is uh, very immediate, especially at night. Plankton pour absolutely everywhere. And so uh, you shine a torch and you see all these weird out outlandish creatures, tentacles, little feet going, uh, eyes everywhere. They glisten and they sparkle and they're just everywhere, masses of them. And you shine it onto a coral, you your launch onto a coral, because the coral then is catching this plankton, like stuffing it into their mouths. And, and you see all sorts of things you never see during the day. So um, night diving is a whole different world for me. When you're there at night with the, the change in the light and the absence of most colour, is it the scientist Charlie Heron that's oh, no. there or is no, it no, some no, other no, sort no. of no, Charlie? Scientist Charlie Heron gets left behind. He gets switched, he goes to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Not that. No, there's this. I, most of my diving is work. That sounds awfully boring, but it is hard work. No, night diving is time off. You're just amazed by it or just delighting? No, I, I get absorbed by it. And that's something I've done all my life. And I love being alone. Um, I, even night diving under any conditions, anywhere, I like to be alone. In fact, any diving, I like to be alone. I just love. If I have one natural gift in this world, it is to love nature and that is nature gone berserk you can't but just sit back and think this is this is what heaven is all about <laughs> i really think any diving on a coral reef is fabulous affects me that way and i have to say i get the same sort of feeling of being alone out in the bush uh, as i often am i go alone and i go into a maybe it's only a few days but i've been alone in a bush and I'm not. I'm not. I'm never frightened of anything. It's not real. I'm frightened of things that are real, but um, in other words, really are mm. a danger. But not sort of things that other people think are dangerous. I'm not frightened of the sharks. Let's talk about the the time that you've encountered sharks. You you were attacked by sharks once. What happened? Once in six thousand hours of diving. Oh, I've been attacked once, by. Once can be enough, though. Charlie. Oh yes, um, they had a real go at me. No, but um, I was in a lagoon, and, and we'd just been doing a transect. It's a, again, on the outer ribbon reefs, the northern Great Barrier Reef, we've just been doing a transect across the, the reef, and I knew this lagoon was there, and we just had one tank in, in our boat, because we just were shallow. It was knee-deep water. But I thought I'd just take a look at the edge of this lagoon, and two sharks came barreling in, and they got more and more into a feeding frenzy. And obviously I was dead. How, how could you tell what the oh, shark do when it's... It's very obvious. They come swim very fast and they, they arch their pectoral fins forward and they make sudden turns. And then I backed into a crevice and they had a big chunk of coral and I held that up so I was protected. On, but one of them just slammed into me and I got winded underwater, which is pretty unpleasant. So not actually trying to bite you, just oh, knocking yeah, you? No, trying to bite me, mouth open and so on. Um, <laughs> I worked my way up to the top of the crevice, which first, fortunately went all the way up to the top, but there was about three metres of water uh, um, between the reef flat and, and the water surface. You can't uh, surface suddenly from scuba diving. 
It's very dangerous to do that. And, and so I went up as fast as I could in between the sharks uh, having another go at me. With your and chunk of coral just trying to yeah, beat them off. Yeah, with my chunk of coral. And um, I got to the surface, but I couldn't see the boat. No boat. It was between me and the setting sun. And I yelled out. Well, they'd seen the shark zipping around. And I went straight down to my crevice again. But about seconds later, the bottom of the boat was there. Oh. And um, I forgot about my chunk of coral. I went up as quickly as I could, and I vaulted over the side of a tin boat. Now, <laughs> I had my weight built and, a, and my tank on. I'm not built like a weightlifter. Um, how on earth could I do that? I can't even remotely do that, but I did it that time. You, you did it when I, there I were two sharks side, ready to eat you. <laughs> with sharks after me. One took a piece out of my fin, and my buddies in the boat would be watching this. They thought it was a great joke, you know, Charlie chased by sharks. And until I started peeling off my wetsuit, and my whole chest had turned black and blue even in that time from the impact of the sharks hitting me. Did that give you pause for thought for the next time you went into the ocean, an experience like that? It was a one-off. It was certainly give me pause for thought to go back to that lagoon. But um, now I've been in plenty of places where there's been loads of sharks. I love sharks. I love being, being with me. I think twice of diving unprotected when there's a tiger shark around or a big bull shark, because they are aggressive. Uh, but basically on the Great Barrier Reef, sharks are not a problem. They very seldom ha uh, harass scuba divers. I mean, sometimes I've asked why once I pulled the tail of a wobbegong um, down the solitary islands. And <laughs> what did you do that for? Uh, I just did it because I was swimming along. It was lying peacefully on the bottom. I pulled its tail <laughs> and it swam off. And it uh, must have been about maybe a minute later, I felt this crunch on my leg and the wobbegong came along. <laughs> Gave you a pull on your, uh, on your tail. <laughs> it didn't do me any harm, but I deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, sharks are not a problem. I, I fear sea snakes are the only things in the water that I really Why? don't like. Why? What, what's the It can be terribly aggressive. I've, I've never encountered a sea snake. What's do? Is it like a, a land snake? Oh, yeah, it's just like a land snake lying on the bottom, and they, they're very sluggish. Uh, most of them are fairly weak. They can't swim through the turbulence of fins, so you can always spin them off. But I, I, working underwater, I, I hammer corals with a with chisel and hammer. They make a lot of noise. And, of course, they come and investigate, and the first thing that happens is I'll snap them in the face with my fins. And that'll make any snake angry. And so, unknown to me, I've got snakes all around me having go at me. Mm. Are they venomous? Oh, God, then. They're much more venomous than man snakes. They're incredibly venomous. And so I always have to have a full wetsuit. I don't wear gloves, but... Um, I've had plenty of photographs of taken by other people of me working on the bottom with sea snakes and having go at me. Yeah. Charlie, what about sea lions? How did you once get yourself a harem almost of sea lions? <laughs> well, I, that was at the Abrolhos Islands in Western Australia, and I, I was down quite deep, and, and I was photographing a coral on, on a vertical wall, and um, I felt this tap on my shoulder. Turned around, there was this gorgeous sea lion. Um, young female, so I, I released some bubbles from my regulator in a spiral, but, but turned back to photograph my coral. As soon as I did that, tap, tap, tap on my shoulder, <laughs> and eventually I gave up and just played with her in the water, whirl the regulator around and make... The regulator's know, part of your diving. Yeah, yeah, make streams of bubbles and spirals. But when I went back to the beach, and um, sea lions, they just poured in, and um, I was surrounded like a, a horseshoe shape audience of sea lions putting their heads underwater and then putting their noses up in the air and and then suddenly this big thing came barreling in it was the it was a big bull and so i cleared out very quickly he wasn't going to share his hair with me that's for sure <laughs> so there's a real curiosity among animals for you as well as oh, for them yeah, under the water you've got to, you can't get away from that um most of my diving is work but sometimes you just got to forget the work and just enjoy. There's lots of amazing things that have happened to me uh, in all this time, but um, obviously love diving on coral reefs. It's, it's, it's part of me. It's right to the depths of my soul. And, and, and then to have it spiced up with, and I love sharks, but sometimes that's been entertaining. And um, uh, whales, whale sharks are wonderful. And I see all sorts of, I love octopus. I, think, I just think octopi are lovely animals. And all sorts, of, I mean, just all sorts. Where did you first get this fascination for the marine world? Charlie? Oh, when I was six years old, 
Um, my mum took me surfing and I got dumped with a dumper and I was just about in tears and I said I'd had enough. So he went around to Long Reef to have a look at the rock platform. This is near Sydney? Near Sydney, near Sydney, one of the Sydney's northern beaches. I just found all sorts of living things there and I went back and... And on my own then, I had a careful mother, but she didn't think I could come any, any harm paddling in pools. Well, I went right to the tip of the, right out to the tip of this huge rock platform where the waves, it, it, it's just churning waves and the tide comes in. It was an incredibly dangerous place. And I spent a lot of time there. <laughs> I, have to, I have to say I turned over lots of rocks until a fisherman told me how to turn them back. But a fisherman roused on me for going out there. And anyhow, I... Um, I caught the catch of my life, which was a beautiful little octopus. And by this time I had an aquarium back home in Linfield in Sydney. And um, this octopus used to come when uh, he was called Oki. And he used to come when come to you? He used to come when he was called. And I put my arm in his, in his aquarium, a little aquarium I had for him. And he climbed up my arm and would take a little piece of shrimp or whatever and crawl back to his little cave I made for him. And then he turned this tan colour and flashed little blue rings at me. He was a blue-ringed octopus. Now, I'm no marine biologist, Charlie, but aren't they extremely dangerous? They're the most dangerous, the most venomous things in the ocean. And it wasn't known. And it wasn't in any book. And it was, it was a headline in the Sydney Morning Herald. Blue-ringed octopus is the most de- dangerous. One bite could kill 12 men. Oh and I goodness. had Oki. They, they have short lifetimes. I had him for a whole year. And he used to crawl out onto my arm every day when I called him and take his dinner and crawl back again. Obviously, he didn't bite me. <laughs> That's, yep, I, I, I feel nervous on your behalf just hearing that. Oh, uh, yes. I love, I love that, Alan. When I, I, when I came back and he was dead, I was absolutely devastated. He what? died of old age. He died a, ha- a happy blue ringed octopus I of old think so, age, yes. and you live to tell the certainly tale. Certainly, well, well, certainly well fed one. What was fascinating you so much about the sort of world you were discovering in the rock pools? Uh, I just grew enormously attached to the animals. I can't learn things when I'm told to learn them, but when it's curiosity driven and I want to know about them, I can't bear not knowing about something. And I, to this day, my daughter recently gives me this, Dad, you've got to. You can't bear not knowing something. But when I do know it and I want to know it, I don't forget it either. So I always build up this this, um, head full of stuff that's come from curiosity. That's how, that's the only thing that gets into my head. And um, I just built up this knowledge of marine life right from the age of six. And I have to say about, about 10 years ago, I went down to Long Reef Rock Platform. I walked out, it was low tide, I walked out to that point and I thought, good grief, a six-year-old needs to play here on his own. You know, it's an incredibly dangerous place and I, I couldn't believe it. And um, of course, my mum used to, she thought I was just paddling in the shallows back in... <laughs> well, I, th- I think that pales next to having the blue-ringed octopus for a pet, but, you know. Mm-hmm. You were given a book as a kid, uh, Australian Seashores. Yes. Mm. Why was that such an important moment? Well, um, that was written by a guy called Professor of, Professor Dakin at Sydney University. And he died when, about the time the book came out, I think, I'm not sure. Anyhow, um, and the name on the front cover was Isabel Bennett. She was Dakin's assistant. And my teacher at school persuaded my mother to take me to see Isabel Bennett. And I loved Isabel Bennett. It's a pretty remarkable thing to take along a a, a kid to meet a professor. Oh, yes. And she was absolutely flabbergasted because the book had only just been published and he was this little kid. Because I I was glued to the book and I I couldn't understand a lot of it. But um, she introduced me to microscopes and she became probably the most influential person in my life. She um, persuaded me to do a lot of things that, that... encouraged me to do a lot of things I did and we remained friends just till she died. It was a very wonderful thing for me and she used to be very much my my buddy. But when I first met her at the university, actually I didn't immediately like her at all. First of all, she said, "Uh, Charlie dear, how nice to see you. An adult had called me Charlie. Now I'd only just got that nickname. And um, no one had ever called, no one had ever called me Charlie before. Kids had. 
Um, but that, and also she stank. Because she <laughs> stank of formalin. That's what she used. I didn't know what formalin was. And, um, but then I showed her my collection of polychaete worms, mostly. And she was absolutely flabbergasted. I knew what all the names were. And my poor mother was brought to tears. But she, I had to be dragged away from Isabel Bennett and, <laughs> and the worms. And I've loved them ever since. Where did you get your nickname, Charlie, from? Oh, then? that was, well... I've always just had this fascination for nature, and I, I used to collect dangerous things. I, I hate having a barrier between me and, and my animals, and one of my pets was a funnel web, Sydney funnel web spider. <laughs> and yes, I was a dear little kid, wasn't I? And I took this to school, I'd known to my mother, of course, in a biscuit tin, and I opened it up to show the kids, <laughs> and of course the teacher nearly collapsed. And confiscated, of course, the tin and the spider. I never saw either again. But then um, on another show and tell, I took along a jar of worms. And my dad had given me a bottle of metho to... Uh, this is before I actually met Isabel Bennett, although I never liked formal and stank too much. But the metho, uh, I used to keep these things, but it had dried out and somewhat. And I'd opened this jar of what I thought were polychaete worms in metho, and they're all dead, and it was they, the class got this huge blast of rotten worm gas, whatever that is. But um, up till then, and during then, my teacher had nicknamed me Mr. Darwin, partly because I was always bringing these things in and terrifying the other kids. I like doing that. And especially the girls, I mean, silly things. They brought dolls to... <laughs> I, no yeah, funnel web like spiders, that, no nothing worthwhile. Webs, nothing worthwhile. And uh, she said, Charles Darwin, get that out of here. So I did. And, of course, that became Charlie, Charlie. <laughs> and so that became my nickname then, and it stayed on. <laughs> As you I always call Charlie. I don't answer to anything else. <laughs> it wasn't just sea creatures, though. You had a dog you loved as a oh, kid. Tell me about Jinka. Yeah, Jinka was, um, he was my um, closest friend friend ever he was a giant dog huge dog and uh he used to he was very very intelligent and he was used to accompany me to the to the bush uh and we would go miles and miles and miles and just jinker and i and we'd find a secluded place and i started doing what i did for long long decades i could sit and absorb what around me and fall into it, um, become wrapped up in, wrapped up in, beside a creek usually, and I'd stop thinking. I know others can do that, but I would stop thinking, maybe for 20 minutes. I would see things, hear things, be aware of things, but not think about them. What was happening instead of thinking? It's called, some people call it meditation, but in, for me it was the dead opposite. I stopped thinking, and I just absorbed in everything around me. And I would come out of that, a thought would enter my head and then I'd come back to normal. And I, I kept doing that into married life. I mean, I was very, very religious at that time because I thought God had created all this wonderful nature that I was in love with. And I felt I was being close to God. And so I would sit and be quiet and be close to God. Did your parents encourage your love of nature and, and fascination with no, animals? No, my, my parents, poor parents. My, mother, well, my father was an army heavyweight and not close to kids, but my mum was a lovely mum, but she was constantly horrified by me. She really was because I would capture scorpions, wasps. I had, this, I had another funnel web called Spooks, which they didn't know about. Spooks, I had an aquarium, Leaky, he lived in an aquarium, she lived in an aquarium, she was a really big fun with this one, and I fed her, and, and she would attack anything, and uh, even another funnel web. And uh, Spooks was only discovered when I had a, was having a nightmare in the night, and Spooks was attacking me, and my mum <coughs> brought me to the surface, and I had to tell her that I had this spider. And, of course, the spider found another home very quickly. <laughs> yes. So were you a kid, Charlie, that had, I mean, the way you're describing it, I imagine you with this whole collection of, yep. you know, lizard skins and spiders I, I, I and a, guinea pigs. What, what was your backyard like? 
my poor parents, it was like a zoo. I used to collect all the things that I was interested in, fossils, rocks, and I used to read a lot about it, and it became really my world. I really had only uh, one other friend who, he wasn't part of it, but, but I didn't need other kids as friends. I had Jinka with me all the time. I was into the, allowed to go wherever I wanted with him. Mum let me just get into the bush and stay there. I sometimes into the, into the night, and I love being in the bush alone at night, even just as I love diving at night. I love the um, the quietness, or maybe the rustles here and rustles. And dark never frightened me. If something did frighten me, I usually did something about it, like caught it and handled it, like spiders and scorpions and wasps. Not wasps, no, they'd sting. But um, I used to collect all these things and used to terrify my sister with praying mantis and cicadas, poor things. She just terrified of them. And my mother used to be just horrified of some of the things I did. I was, I was a little horrified. <laughs> yes. On air, online, and on your mobile. This is Conversations on ABC Radio. You can subscribe to our podcast. It's easy and it's free. Go to abc.net.au slash conversations. Charlie, you were talking about um, your parents being, uh, maybe bemused is the polite word, unsure how to handle your passionate interest in all living things. Mm. What about school? Was that a place where your your interests were encouraged? In very early school, yes, because I had uh, this wonderful teacher. But then I went to a Sydney private school, Barker, and um, all hell let loose. It was, it was terrible for me. This was a, an age which is nothing like the age today. At school, bullying was encouraged. It wasn't just discouraged, it was encouraged. I can't bear cruelty, either to animals or to other children. And I was big for my age, and really, I was, I was very violent. I had a violent temper, but not, not under control, only against cruelty. What kind of cruelty would you see um, at school? I first attacked a kid who was thought he'd, uh, he, he was having a, a go at me, um, was burning ants with a magnifying glass. All right, they told me to go away. And, but the next day they were going to have fun with me and they're pulling legs off a cicada and as the little thing th- screamed in, in pain. And I um, half killed this kid, actually. And so I was left alone, pretty much. It's very hard to explain, but uh, the world I, I loved, the natural world, wasn't taught at the school. We were told what we had to know. We were told what we had to think. And I really tried to do this, and I couldn't. I couldn't, and I got worse. All of my secondary school, I was near the bottom of every class. I tried, and I was unable to learn. And I developed asthma, and I don't know if school had anything to do with that, but it got really severe, so I couldn't play any sport. I never learned any sport, couldn't catch a ball or anything like that. And then I developed a stutter, and so I could barely speak at all. It seems strange to me not being able to people chat on. Not being You're making to, up for it now. I'm making up for it now. But um, mid-secondary school, I, I would have trouble um, walking briskly 50 metres. I couldn't speak. What did that mean for your social life at school? I didn't school? have any. Um, I had a, the, the stutter and asthma. I could play no sport, although the school insisted I did. Um, but that was unending humiliation. And being near the bottom of every class, I hated school. I just hated from beginning to end. And I often, took, well, sometimes took revenge on some of the teachers by doing bad things like gluing their desk drawer shut and some things like that. But I, I got a really healthy contempt for a lot of the teachers. I, I was very, very knowledgeable because um, I read an awful lot of National Geographic magazines but also even encyclopedias I'd read. But that didn't penetrate my inability to to learn what the school said I had to learn. And so come the leaving certificate, I got four Bs, in fa- um, and uh, which is the lowest possible score to get a leaving certificate. Um, I really wanted to go to Hawkesbury Agricultural College to get away from the city into as much rural as I could. So it was agreed I re- would repeat the year. Uh, I don't know, I'm surprised that Barker allowed me back, but I 
I, I repeated the year and didn't get much better results. So no, no scholarship. Anyhow, my father got a letter from the Department of Education. They were running um, trials, aptitude tests for kids because there was a study had shown there was very little correlation between school results and university uh, performance. And so uh, my father was a heavyweight in the army. He bludgeoned me into going yet another, as I saw another round of exams. I already failed two lots. You know, I left early. It was a whole gymnasium full of kids. And I was one of the first to leave and think, oh, well, it was another waste of time. And I was going to go as a jackaroo. I was just going to get out and go west. And I would have if it wasn't for Jinko. I couldn't take him with me. I was going to hitchhike. Anyhow, another letter arrived, and it was a smaller group of kids. And I was refusing to go at first. My father prevailed. And then, then another letter arrived, and it was just a little tiny room full of kids. And we were ushered in one at a time to a panel. And um, they said, what do you want to do? I said, you mean I got a scholarship? And they said, well, of course you got a scholarship. That's not why you're here. I said, why am I here? And uh, they said, well, there's only 10. We're handing, we're handing out 10 scholarships for children to do anything they want at any university, and you're one of them. Oh, that's <laughs> so, quite a contrast to a kid who came well, at the bottom uh, of his class through of school. Of course, I didn't believe any of it. And uh, I said, what do you suppose I'm good at, gifted at? And they said, well, kids like you are um, usually very good at mathematics. And I actually got up, I thanked them, I said, this is a complete mistake, I'll never pass a math exam in my life. And I was walking out, and this woman who was in charge said, we know, we've been talking to Barker College about <laughs> you. So I turned around and sat down in the chair in complete disbelief. And that's how I got my scholarship. Did it change your self-confidence hearing that? Well, I went to Armidale, the University of New England because that was the only rural university. I just wanted to get as far away from the city as I possibly could. And I wanted to enrol in psychology to find out how I got the scholarship, who I was. And, um, well, I wanted to study psychology, but I couldn't, because that was in the arts faculty. Um, I did science subjects, and I loved them all. And then... Were uh, you studying choral in Oh, no, 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 no. No, um, I w wound up doing a master's degree on reptilian physiology. And then... Um, uh, that was done and I went out jogging and I saw dragonflies change colour. And I thought, what on earth's going on here? And they're doing some rituals with the sunlight in the morning. And um, that became my PhD. So I was an entomologist. Uh, but at that time, just to get away from having to study all the time, I took up scuba diving and uh, with, with some friends. The uh, university in Townsville... Uh, James Cook University advertised for someone to do a postdoc on corals. And I was going off to Canada to do more work on insects. And then I read Isabel Bennett, same author. Isabel Bennett, who you read as a little yep. six or seven year old yep. falling in By love then, with rock Another pools. book she'd just published about the Great Barrier Reef. And I was thumbing through that. I thought, oh no, I'm, this is for me. I'm not going to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> two more letters. One to say, forget the last letter I wrote, please, I want, this, I want that postdoc, and to Canada saying no thanks. So you, you took um, this postdoc to study reefs up at Townsville? Without ever being in a single lecture in marine biology, and I've never been to one. I've given lots, but I've never been to a single lecture in marine biology. I've never studied corals. I've never studied anything to do with any of it. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> so how did you spend those early years at well, that postdoc? What were you I doing? Was, I knew nothing about it. And fortunately, I was left alone and I trooped up and down the Great Bay. I had a lot of money to get on to hire boats. And I trooped up and down the Great Bay and went diving all the time. And I was left for two years to teach myself about corals and what I taught myself bore no resemblance to the museum-based coral taxonomy of that time. And uh, my view of corals was totally new and different. What was different about what well, you were seeing? Uh, it, when you dive down the face of a reef, a particular coral, species of coral, changes for something like something small and nuggety where waves hammered in to something like maybe had long fine branches in deep water. And you can see one grading into the other. Well, the, the old monographs said they're all different species. Well, they weren't. They're all one species. 
and so I guess gave them nicknames. But then the Australian Institute of Marine Science started up and I became their first again through a... Of course I got drunk at the vice chancellor's party who <laughs> was welcoming the new director and he wanted... To, he actually came to Australia because he wanted to meet some wild young Australians. He thought we were like the wild west of America. And um, he was delighted to meet me and then found out that actually he was working on coral. So <laughs> I was the first scientist that Ames employed. And, um, and my job was to monograph the corals of the Great Barrier Reef in three years. What does it mean to monograph the corals? It means to write yet another long, technical, boring accounts of species by species by species. And that involved a lot of museum work. So I travel a lot to European, American uh, museums. I was learning to be a, a taxonomist. But it was a very, very different taxonomy and it outraged lots of people, the things I said. It is the taxonomies everyone uses today. And is that partly, Charlie, because you were actually doing things in the field Absolutely, differently? Totally. That's what was, totally. was changing. Yeah, I couldn't follow these monographs. They had all big, complicated words. and I mean, some of them were even written in Latin. I couldn't read English, let alone Latin. And, I mean, I, 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 was, I learned nothing at school. I didn't, you know, and, and, and so it was a very, very strange internet but it was the best grounding I could possibly have I made up my own mind about absolutely everything and um, that's the way it was and it worked. Were some of the corals that you were encountering would you have been the first person to to look at them the first person to describe them? About half of all the species I have looked at I was the first person to give them a sort of a reality. A name existed on a museum specimen, like uh, or you might have a camellia. You know what a camellia is, so do I. But the name camellia doesn't mean much until you connect it with something you might get in a nursery or see in a garden. That's what I did. About half of all corals didn't have any connection with something that existed in nature. And then an awful lot more didn't even have a name, uh, and so I started giving them names. How do you, uh, how do you choose a name for a coral? That's always been an, a difficult thing for me. It's supposed to all be in Latin. I don't know any Latin. But um, I often named it after a colour or a place or um, a wife or a, all these sorts of things. And I used to joke about um, the worst thing you could do is name a coral after a, a colour, a place or a woman because they're all so changeable that <laughs> it's bound to be wrong. No, that was, that's a joke. But um, uh, no, I've named an awful lot of um, corals for lots of relevant reasons, but the it wasn't so much the naming of the corals, it was associating that name with something you could actually see in reality. You mean so with like, the bigger ecosystem yeah, that they're the a part thing, of? And you could dive down the side of the reef and see how that one coral changed. And when I started publishing this, it caused a big negative... I mean, it, it was trounced on and by some people. And it's not trounced on anymore. <laughs> they use these names. I can see that, you know, part of the personality that you have meant that being able to work alone and in following your own curiosity was really important. Mm. What is it about your mind, the way your mind works, that fitted you for this work? Uh, it was... I was ideally fitted to it because... I haven't got any Aboriginal genes in, it, in me, but I think somehow, somewhere, they got snuck in. But I don't know, but I, I have this very close affinity with the natural world. It's very close, and I have to say I'm, I'm observant, and I remember things that I want to know. It's the very opposite of my schooling. I, I was really good at this for the very same reasons I was really bad at school. I, I saw things, I remembered them, I was curious, and I wanted to work it out, and I kept on and on and on working it out until I'd worked out all the species of the Great Barrier Reef and, and all their colours and shapes and forms and depths and so on. It was just the love of what I was doing, and I also knew it was going to be very valuable work. It was going to be used by people. Um, it's very fulfilling to be able to do that and so I started writing books for, for the general public. Do you think that your mind works with with pattern differently than than the rest of us? My mind certainly <laughs> seems to work differently than most people. <laughs> um, but Just I, trying to think about how that memory works, how you can distinguish different parts of coral or work out the relationship of part to another. You must be you must be categorizing things differently when you look at yeah. them than, than I than I do. 
Yeah, I've, I've got that sort of memory. I have virtually never forget anything that's interesting. I guess doing this, I just remembered, and then on the Great Barrier, then, then Western Australia, then, then in Japan, and then all over the world. Um, I now can see any coral from any part of the world. I usually know where it's from. It's what its depth is. What it's, you know, I, I remember it all. It's very much curiosity-driven. In Armadale, Charlie, you also met your first wife, Kirsty, and then you moved together to a property outside of Townsville. Tell yes. me about Rivendell. Um, it was a very secu- a secluded, tree-laden place, um, out in the bush and, again, remote, and it's just surrounded by the natural world. Um, it's where I've done all my work. Um, I, could ne- I could really could never live in a city. I have to... I have to be in the natural world. I don't want to live in anywhere that's not the natural world. And Rivendell, that became loved by a lot of people. And most famous biologists you can think of ever worked on reefs have been there. And uh, it's a, just a lovely place to drink wine and talk and, and, and enjoy life. If we go back to that family time with with Kirsty, the decade between 1970 and 1980, it mm. was a period as well as this joyful memories and happy times of, of enormous loss for you and mm. for your family. And most tragic of those would be in 1980 when your eldest daughter, Noni, died. Can you tell me what happened, Charlie? Um, um, she was drowned in a creek. Um, uh, I was in Hong Kong at the time and Kirsty had taken her to a pic- for a picnic. And um, we don't know quite how, but um, I think she was pinned under a rock, probably knocked unconscious. Um, she was a very adventurous little girl. She um, she'd been she'd done quite a bit of scuba diving with me at the age of eight. She was scuba diving with wow. me and horse riding, and and she was an exact copy of me um, as far as being a nature lover is concerned. Uh, she. Uh, was also a, a brilliant musician. So she was very much the centre of my life. And, um, yep, yeah, uh, I've... My life changed. Mm-hmm. You say so you were in Hong Kong when you got that phone call. It must have been incredibly hard to have that news away from your wife, away from home. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, well, decades went on before I could even talk about it. Mm. Still can't actually. Yeah. Um, uh, I never slept. I didn't sleep properly for years. Um, no, it was the end of me virtually. Uh, it was the end of who I used to be. Um, it was the end of my life of peace and love. Yeah. Mm. You became for a time a, a kind of support for other parents had suffered mm. the loss of a child mm. was that a comfort no it was doing good things and one likes to do good things of people in extreme distress but it really took it out of me but the thing is parents mothers that have uh, lost children they're very very um, sensitive to the thoughts of others they can hear the thoughts of others. So I could talk to these people, especially mothers, and I did. When someone goes through a time of extreme stress, there are things to do and things to say and things not to do and not to say. I would um, be able to talk to a mother in ways that mattered and stop other people doing the wrong thing, like trying to clear away all the toys and so on of that child and put their room into something it wasn't, which was the fashion in those days. But it did bring about the end of my innocence, I suppose, of my um, being able to absorb myself in selfishly, if you like, in in my own world. I withdrew from the world and opened more and more into a cocoon and um, less and less the adventurous, certainly not the adventurous person I used, used to be, yeah. Did the natural world, was that a place of solace, oh, of yeah. comfort for yeah. you? Mm, yep. Diving? Diving, yep. Yep, kept on diving as much as I possibly could. Well, it, I had to be with Kirsty, and so they were the two things. But I 
kept on being connected with nature. Living at Rivendell and diving, I would have gone insane without that. Maybe I did go a little bit of insane. I, I became uh, very um, self-contained. Not a person really I'd want to know. It damaged me a lot, yeah. Mm, all I can say is that. When you look back now, Charlie, is there a point where it looks like you recovered yourself a little bit? Can you can you see where that started? Yeah. The balance started to change again? It is true that time cures to a certain extent, but it doesn't cure other things. So I certainly got back to my what appeared to be my normal self quite quickly. I would go to work and I could um, joke and talk and so on, but actually I was talking to Noni in my head. I could hear a voice, we'd have the same arguments and so on. So that was um, me being another person. That was not who I was anymore. I never have been since, really. And some things that just said other people believe in, it's just not true. You don't, time doesn't cure all. Um, it doesn't for me anyhow. I can't be as I as I used to be. It, it, it was the end of, it, of my marriage too. We were just battered to death because that wasn't the only thing that happened. And we'd had second child also died as a baby, and two nasty miscarriages. One was dreadful. Um, so it was a, these things really just our marriage was, was survival mechanism more than anything else. So I became very much a recluse. Kirsty moved into town and I just kept on living out at Rivendell all on my own. In fact, I used to take the phone off the hook at night for fear someone would call me. You know, I, I really wanted to not be with anyone except my dog. Yep, for a long time, yeah. And then I, um, I met Mary, who is the second, my second wife, and things changed. Mm. Things changed. And you and her work together now. Oh, right? yes, uh, yes. Um, we complement each other very well. Um, I'm the the naturalist, the coral guy, and she's very clever at what she's a coral person too. She's also very, very exceptionally good at computing, computers. And I hate computers. <laughs> I work with them all the time. And, oh, I hate them. Um, she loves them. And so that works out very well. She does that um, or teaches me or fixes things for me. Hearing you describe uh, the way that you've managed to sort of follow your curiosity as a scientist to mm. really pursue these these areas that, that grabbed you and held on to you and that you needed to know about. Mm. Do you think it's harder to do that sort of science now, to have oh. that sort of career? Um, I left, I had a, my job at the Strange Institute of Marine Science. I had an almost unique classification. I could not be demoted. I could not be sacked any time ever in my life. It would have taken a, an act of parliament to sack me. <laughs> That's maybe too extreme. Charlie. Well, I thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, I mean, heavens above. I could be wheeled in there with a, with a nurse and an oxygen bottle and <laughs> still be on full salary. Oh, no, was, that was bizarre. But I left anyhow because um, it's the way bureaucracy's taken over everything and I can't stand it. Uh, it's just destroyed. It's destroyed everything. It's destroyed. The, the worst thing you can possibly do to a scientist who's got lots of love and initiative is to tell them what to work on, where to work and when to work. It just destroys them. They're not scientists anymore. They can't be. Um, a lot of my colleagues manage it. They get around it somehow or other, but I couldn't do that, and I left. And I um, was pretty happy leaving. And they were pretty happy to be rid of me too because I was such a trouble. I've always been a troublemaker for bureaucrats. I've just made their life as miserable as they've made mine. It's always... <laughs> it's, it's been a war um, for the last... 30 years between me and bureaucrats because they, I just have, we just are two very different types of people and I'm afraid we don't get on. Two very different types of coral in the one ecosystem. <laughs> yes. When you described how as a kid being alone and being alone in nature mm. was so important to you and so shaped the interest that you went on to develop with such importance for science... I wonder if kids have that opportunity now for the for oh, the no, they quiet don't. and the it's freedom. It's horrible. It's, they, they don't. Well, 
some kids more than others, but so many children today are brought out without contact with the natural world. I am me because I am me for the one and only reason my mother let me have the freedom to go into the bush and be myself. That made me. That made me the person who followed their curiosity, who wanted to know about things, look things up or find things or keep them in aquaria, even if they were any web spiders. Um, that moulded my personality completely. I'm absolutely sure of this. And that is not unusual. It's common. Um, I know a lot of high-achieving scientists and my story is not unusual. Is the reef, the water, the landscape that feels most like home to you? I think so, yes. Yes, um, it is the place that I connect to most. But I still have to say I connect to the Hawkesbury River sandstone country that I used to be as a little child. Probably that connects to me on land more than anything else still after all these years. These are the things that I, places that I want to be, and I really don't want to be anything else, in anywhere else except back in the few environments that I've been free to be myself in. That's what matters is who I am. Charlie, it has been such a delight to speak to you. I want you to come back tomorrow and explain the entire Great Barrier Reef to me in one hour. I know you can do that. But for now, thank you so much for being my guest on Conversations. Oh, it's been a great pleasure. And thank you very much for all your nice questions.